Career Services. I work remotely from Syracuse, New York. I'm really excited to have three representatives from the Social Security Administration with us today, as well as a co-worker, uh, Terry Lynn Cook, who's helping, doing a great job managing the chat. I would be, uh, I'd be lost without an assistant in here today, so she's doing a great job. Um, I'm going to quickly uh, uh, introduce by name our guests, ask them to say hello. They'll, they'll tell where they're uh, what their title is and where they work from. And then we're going to have uh, David Marshall, uh, who's one of the representatives sharing information. So David, why don't we start with you? If you want to say hello, share your title, tell where you're located and anything else. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, again, my name is David Marshall. I'm located in Kansas City, Missouri, and I am a recruitment and retention coordinator here in Kansas City. Thanks, David. Uh, Angela, you want to say hello? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Hubbard. I am the district manager in the Manchester, New Hampshire field office, and I oversee the Nashua, New Hampshire and Keene, New Hampshire offices. Yeah, right in our backyard of our uh, campus. Hi. And last but not least, uh, Patrick Cook. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Patrick Cook. I'm an analyst in the Boston Regional Office of the Social Security Administration. I've been with the agency for almost 15 years. I started my career as a customer service representative in Jackson, Mississippi, and am now up here in Boston and uh, just excited to be here today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. OK, um, I'm going to turn it over to David just in one second. I just want to state that if there's anything about the presentation today that uh, is not accessible for you because of any special needs you have, please get in touch with us and we'll make sure that you get the accommodations you need going forward. We can be contacted by email at career uh, at snhu.edu. And if you have any career advising related needs, we'd love to hear from you. C-O-C-E career at snhu.edu. Uh, I'm now going to turn it over to David, who's got a bunch of great information to share. And as I said a minute ago, if you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can at the end. So over to you, David. Oh, David, you're muted. There, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, let me try this again. All right, uh, again, my name is David Marshall. I am the Recruitment and Retention Coordinator for the Social Security Administration in the Kansas City region, uh, which means our region has four states in it, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska. Uh, I've been with the agency for 31 years, and have found it to be very fulfilling, a uh, very rewarding career. We really have a great mission of public service, and I'm going to talk about that here on this next slide. So here is a quick rundown of the who, the what, the why, and the where of Social Security. So regarding who we are, we are one of the largest federal agencies in the country. We have almost 60,000 employees nationally. Um, as for uh, what we are what we do, uh, we started back in 1935 when FDR signed the Social Security Act. Now, this act was intended to provide for the general welfare by establishing a system of federal old age benefits and helping states make more adequate provisions for aged and disabled persons. That was part of Roosevelt's New Deal program. Now, taxes were first collected starting in 1937, and that was also when the first benefits started being paid. Social Security has expanded its purpose over the years, and we now administer retirement, disability, and that includes both Social Security and SSI, along with survivor benefits and Medicare. Uh, the why of what we do is public service. Uh, many people depend on Social Security to survive, and knowing you have a part in that mission, that, that is just really, really rewarding. So as for the where of where we're located, uh, if you're in one of our 50 states, we have field offices in each of those 50 states. Uh, we also have what we call teleservice centers and program service centers, and those are located in various cities across the U.S. Now, our field offices are where the public comes in to conduct business face-to-face. -face. Uh, they can also conduct business over the phone there. 
our teleservice centers are staffed by people that are strictly answering our 1-800 number. And our program service centers are where we take post-adjudicative actions on cases that aren't able to be automated. So it has the least public contact of our three components. Now, for job opportunities, the entry-level positions we normally post for externally include our contact representative or customer service rep. Um, that is found in our field offices, our teleservice centers, and our program service centers. So these positions usually are posted at the GS5, GS6, or the GS7 grade level. It has a career ladder up to a GS8. Now, the responsibilities for each will depend on the component but they all do involve contact with the public either in person or over the phone. Next, we have our legal administrative specialist or benefit authorizer position. This one is only located in our program service centers. Uh, we actually have eight of those um, and located in seven different cities. Those are usually posted at the GS5 or GS7 grade level, and they have a career ladder up to a GS9. Now, this position deals heavily in analysis of our records and correction of items that are not able to be automated. So we find people that really like puzzles uh, and that kind of analytical thinking, they normally do really well in this position. As I mentioned before, it is going to be the position that has the least public contact. So if that's your jam, this would be a good fit for you. And then lastly, we have our social insurance specialist or claim specialist position. That is found in, again, our field offices, program service center, and what we call workload support units. Those can be located in all of our components. Uh, some are in program service centers, some are in field offices, and some are in teleservice centers. Um, these positions deal with adjudication of claims, and they're usually posted at the GS5, GS7, or the GS9 level. That career ladder goes up to a GS11. Now, with the salaries that are posted here in the salary ranges, there are asterisks, and that is because this is the general pay scale amount, but if you are in a metro area, um, that salary is going to be higher than what is shown here uh, based on locality pay. So, as you can see, we have a lot of different entry-level positions and many different components. So, that provides some great opportunities, no matter what your skill set or where you're located. Uh, personally. Oh, sorry about that. I jumped the gun here. Um, personally, I started way back uh, in the day in the early 90s out of college at a grade three file clerk. Uh, and I've had 15 different positions during my career. Every position list on this slide I've done, uh, as well as various team leader and management positions. So again, a lot of career and growth opportunities at Social Security. You should be able to find something that fits your skill set and your interests. So let's talk about employee benefits, uh, and these are federal benefits, which is an area of importance for everyone, including us and I'm sure our prospective employees, and they're really a point of pride for federal agencies. So as you can see, aside from a paycheck, you also get paid vacation and sick leave that you get right from the start of joining us, along with 11 paid federal holidays. We have health benefits, which include dental and vision, and we have life insurance. On top of that, we have a federal uh, retirement pension, and then we also have a thrift savings plan, which is our version of a 401k. So our thrift savings plan does allow you to invest in various funds and includes an additional up to 5% matching from Social Security. So to try to quantify the amount of our benefit package when you add all these things up, uh, it can potentially be close to 50% of your salary, so pretty big stuff there. Now, most federal positions do involve flexible schedules. Social Security is no exception. So that means you can come in during a flexible band in the morning. So, for example, in our program service centers, our hours of work are 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That means employees can start their work day as early as 6 or as late as 9.30 in the morning and anywhere in between that. So that flexible band is, of course, different depending on the component, but it's a really nice option regarding how you want to schedule your work day along with other responsibilities that you might have outside of work. Most of our positions also have optional overtime available, uh, and we let our employees earn credit hours, and they do that by extending their workday, which allows you to build up additional paid time off. Again, that is going to vary by component. And then at SSA, we also currently offer telework for our positions, 
once again, it's going to vary by component. So for instance, our field office employees, uh, when they're done training, they can currently work from home two days a week. Our teleservice center and program service center employees can work from home four days a week once training is complete. Now, one caveat to that I do need to state, um, and I'll state it later too, we do require all employees live within two hours of their reporting duty station. And then the last thing on here, federal employees are eligible for the Public Service Student Loan Forgiveness Program. So that's another nice option there. Now, this slide is going to give you some requirements that all applicants must meet in order to get hired. Number one, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Number two, if applicable, you must have registered for, with this selective service, so that would be the mail. Uh, number three, you must pass a background and or security investigation. All our offers of employment are contingent upon passing a pre-screening background investigation. And then if you are selected, you're required to serve a probationary and or trial period. Now, how to apply is important. And when it comes to how to apply for our entry-level positions, you currently have a couple options. Uh, we do post our vacancies to usajobs.gov, which is also where other federal agencies post their vacancies. Uh, now, I do want to state some of our postings are only open for five days. Some could be open for months. It depends on how that component wants to post it. So my suggestion would be to set up an account if you don't already have one in usajobs.gov. And when you have that account set up, you can also set up a notification that will alert you when jobs in your area of interest or location are open. Uh, we do have non-competitive hiring authorities as well, like VRA, the Veterans Recruitment Authority, uh, Schedule A, which is for uh, disabled individuals, military spouse, Peace Corps, those are non-competitive. So it used to be only non-competitive and USA jobs was the only way that you could apply. But now you see in the second bullet, we have something called the Direct Hiring Authority, and we have been authorized to use that through March of 2025. So what this means is we can also now accept resumes for consideration of our entry-level positions that I mentioned just a little bit ago. We did not used to be able to do that. You couldn't just send us a resume. Now you can actually send a resume, and that's your application. So for the Kansas City region, which again is Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, we have a centralized mailbox set up for people to send a resume, and that is listed on this screen. It is KC dot resumes at ssa.gov. So I know that's going to spur some questions as to, well, where do I send my resume for this state and that state? I do not have that information. And part of that reason is um, not everybody has a centralized mailbox. I can say we do because we're a smaller region, but we have some bigger regions that have a lot of states and it would be a lot tougher for them. So they might have actual mailboxes by component, but I am not aware of what those are. However, you will see ssa.gov slash careers listed on here. That does have other information that can uh, send you on how to apply under that direct hiring authority. Resumes, I like to do a little thing on federal resumes, and I do that because a federal resume is quite different than a private sector resume. So for federal resumes, uh, the most effective ones when applying for federal jobs are those that clearly articulate how your skills and experiences align to the qualification requirements that are outlined in our vacancy announcements. So unlike a private sector resume that might be one or two pages, ours can be much longer uh, because you have to put a lot of detail in there. So it is important to be articulate, but use as much space as you need to communicate your work experience. Your resume must be detailed so that you can qualify for positions and appropriate grade levels. Qualifications can be based on education, experience, or a combination of the two, and that will be outlined in our vacancy posting in USA Jobs. Now, to receive credit for experience, it's important you provide a thorough description of experience in the resume, and that includes dates for each work experience listed. Now, when you put those dates, you want to put it in month, day, year format, and I'll let you know why. So if someone just listed 2019 to 2020, that could be a lot of things, right? Maybe you worked December 31st of 2019. You showed up on January 1st of 2020, said, this is not my thing. I'm out of here. That's 2019 to 2020, but it's two days of experience, that's not going to count for much. But it also could be two full years of experience. Maybe you have the full years of 2019 and 2020. 
So make sure you use that month, day, year format so that you can get the maximum credit for that experience. You also want to read the required specialized experience section of those job postings. Your resume should clearly explain your experience in all or most of the areas as applicable to you. Now, common requirements include applying rules, policies, or procedures to provide customer assistance, answering or asking questions to obtain or provide information, and then experience using a computer to enter data. Lastly, uh, using any kind of general phrases like, you know, I, I did payroll accounting. Well, that doesn't tell us really what, how you did it or what you used to do it. So if you used a computer, computer programs, or other automation tools, uh, you want to make sure that you have listed that. It's also important that you're specific in communicating what you actually did, how you did it, and if it made a difference, make sure that is listed. Now, note that a four-year degree does not automatically qualify you for our entry-level positions. Um, so providing that transcript, I'm sorry, a four-year degree does automatically qualify you for our entry-level positions. So providing that transcript is really important. Now, if you're still in school and you don't have a four-year degree yet, you could still qualify based on experience or a combination of education and experience. So as I wrap up this part of the session, I did want to let you all know where you can find out more information on our positions. So I've mentioned ssa.gov slash careers. That is a great way to get information on how to apply, our career paths, and our positions, and our special hiring program. And we also recently added what we call day in the life videos uh, for the entry level positions I mentioned earlier. Basically, that's going to tell you more of what those jobs entail, give you kind of an idea of the job itself. Those can be found also on the ssa.gov slash careers website. Uh, you can also locate them in Handshake, and you can locate them in LinkedIn as well. So before I open it up for questions um, from the group, I do want to post the most common questions that we get from students that are potentially interested in a career with SSA. So I'll give you those answers now, and then we'll see what other questions you have. Number one question we get, do you have internships? And at the moment, I am not aware if any of our regions that do. Um, it is possible some might, um, but if so, it'd be pretty limited. It is something we are looking to offer in the future, but right now I'm not aware, I'm sorry, uh, that we have any of those. Second, do you have remote positions? This one has really gotten popular uh, after the pandemic. So the entry level positions that I mentioned earlier, none of them are 100% remote. Um, most are going to involve you being on site while in training, um, and then you get the ability to work from home, uh, the telework I mentioned, once training is completed. We do require our employees live within two hours of their duty station, so that's very important. Another question we get a lot from students, especially uh, when they're international students, can I still work for SSA? Although they might have a work authorization, you have to be a U.S. citizen to work for Social Security. How long is training is a common question, and this one really depends on the position, but normally it's between three to seven months. So we do pay you while you go through training. Uh, most of the time, though, you are going to be under a fixed shift during the training period, and that is because the majority of our training uh, classes, you're in with other people. So everybody kind of starts at the same time and ends at the same time. The last question that I'll handle here is part-time positions. That can be something folks are interested in. We do have them. Um, they are limited in number, and employees do have to be finished with training before they can submit a request to be part-time. So I know that's a lot of information, uh, so we will open it up right now for any other questions uh, that you might have. Uh, again, for anybody that joined a little bit later, it's not just me here from Social Security. We have Patrick Cook. He works in our Boston region. And then Angela Hubbard is one of our managers, uh, our district manager in the Manchester, New Hampshire office. So we are ready to answer some of those questions. Tori Lind, uh, there's, they've been flying into the uh, chat. You've had your hands Live full. Like hotcakes. Yeah, hopefully you've been able to capture most of them. Um, uh, and I did put in the chat earlier, if you have a question and it's really important to you, we don't get to it, email us at cocecareer at snu.edu and we'll help you get an answer. 
let's get right to the questions. Tori Lynn? Sure. So one, it seems like a consistent question that we've received. Um, a few individuals stated they, they've applied for positions, but they haven't heard back yet. So what would be, I guess, uh, some tips or protocol for how to follow up? Yeah, you, you can certainly, it, and that is going to depend on how you applied. I'll put it that way. So if you did send in a resume, if you found a spot to send your resume in for consideration, you could certainly email that place again. Um, if you've applied through usajobs.gov, there's going to be a staffing specialist that is listed on there. Um, that could be somebody that you could communicate with. Um, I will tell you, and I'm not saying this is ideal, but it, uh, it, it is the way that it is. Um, under direct hiring authority, a lot of times, since we can hold these for a couple years, and what that means is if you've sent something in, um, if somebody gets a vacancy, maybe they don't have one right now, but maybe uh, next year they do get a vacancy. The fact you sent one in in May of 2024, you could still be considered for a position that is being filled in January of 2025. You don't have to apply again. So a lot of times what could be is you've sent your resume to maybe an, a field office and they haven't contacted you because they just might not have a vacancy. Um, based on the number of people that do this, they're likely not going to be reaching out individually to tell you where they're at in the process. So that is a difference than when we used to post these jobs in usajobs.gov, um, not part of direct hiring authority. You would get updates that would say, you know, you've been referred and things like that. Unfortunately, the direct hiring authority is kind of taking that part of it out. Um, so certainly you could follow up, but just know that once your stuff is there, it's kind of a, a wait and see kind of approach. They've got that information. If they need anything else from you, they'll reach out to you. Um, but just know that's the, the rationale behind it. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, David, I appreciate that explanation because a lot of people you know, they were asking that question. So another question that we had to show up in the chat, uh, Melissa asked a question. Uh, she says she doesn't have a copy of her transcript yet as she just graduated. Uh, the closing date for a position is May 31st for a position she applied for. Is she able to add uh, her transcript at a later date or does yes. it have to be everything at one time? Yep, yep. She can uh, she can provide that at a later date. Usually, what happens is, in our process, is the direct hiring authority has shortened it, but it's still some time. So, for instance, you could have a position that has a closing date of May 31st, but they're actually not looking to actually fill the position until July, August, September. Um, that is that is common for us. So, by that time, of course, you will have your transcript. It would be necessary if that is how you up. Uh, qualified. Um, and again, depending on your grades and the type of degree you have, that could give you a higher grade level as well. So that would be something you would want to make sure that you let the folks know that you've got it and you'll send it when you get it and you should be covered for that. Great. Thank you so much for that. Another question that we had was, uh, how long is the hiring process? Yeah, kind of hit on this. Um, it can take months and part of that of course is it, it depends on the number of positions that they are hiring for and the number of interviews they're going to do so like angela is in a field office a lot of times our field offices when they hire they might hire one or two people uh, they might only have to interview five ten people something like that um, that process is probably going to be a little bit shorter our teleservice center and program service centers hire much higher numbers for instance, we posted a job in our teleservice center. They're going to hire over 100 employees. They are going to be interviewing hundreds of people. That is going to be a longer process for that. Uh, so it really kind of depends uh, a lot on the number of people being interviewed, uh, when they think that job is going to actually open, and things like that. Thank you again, David. I appreciate that uh, response. I'm trying to get as many questions as possible in here because we have quite a few. But another question that we had was, how does the Schedule A hiring work? Yeah, that Schedule A is our non-competitive hiring authority. So anybody that wants to uh, try to come in under that, 
you have to provide what's called a Schedule A type letter. And that is something that you can get from your doctor. They are, are well aware of what that means. But it shows that you have a documented disability. Uh, and you would want to provide that along with your transcript, if you have one, uh, your resume, certainly. And then somebody from our staffing uh, team will look at that. And then they will let you know if you would be eligible under that Schedule A. doesn't change the grade levels or anything like that, but it is another option to be hired into. Um, and is a really good non-competitive. A lot of what we're doing now is direct hiring authority just because it's a limited thing we have. Schedule A, though, is something uh, that will, even when we're not in direct hiring authority, Schedule A will be an option for you. Tori Lynn, I'm going to jump in super quick. Uh, David, sure. I, I got a feeling we have yet a few more questions. Would you be able to stay just a little bit longer, five, 10 minutes yep. after the hour? Absolutely. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much. Back to you, you Tori Sure. So I'll, I'll keep the questions rolling. I had a question. Uh, well, uh, actually, a few people asked if you all hire for cybersecurity analyst roles. I did provide um, as well as you provided in the presentation where they can uh, see those job postings. But if you can share a little bit more about that, that would be great. Yeah, we do have those kind of positions. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they tend to be located uh, at our headquarters department, the majority of those. Um, and that is in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, now, there could still be some regionally as well. Those and sometimes even our IT positions tend to be ones that we hire for internally, uh, promote for, I should say, internally. I'm not saying we don't ever post them externally. I will say they are not part of the direct hiring authority. So if there is one of those positions, Tori Lynn, good that you posted the thing about usajobs.gov because that's where they're going to locate that. Awesome. Okay. So I have another question uh, that came about, um, do you all offer any type of relocation packages? For the most part, no, um, on that kind of thing. Again, sometimes internally we will have a position. They tend to be um, maybe in more remote areas, uh, sometimes maybe a management position or something like that. But our entry level positions, unfortunately, do not pay relocation. Thank you. Another question. So um, will SSA have job fairs that are similar to uh, the IRS where they offer uh, actually provide job offers on site? Um, there's individual who said that they did apply for a few positions, but, you know, they realized the process is very long. So they were interested in, you know, knowing if you all possibly do these job fairs where you hire on site. Yeah, at this point, I'm not aware that we do. I know in my region we do not, um, and I, I am aware uh, IRS has a big facility located in Kansas City as well, and they do have those hiring events where they will interview and offer a job on the spot. Our process is not that. Um, ours is you're going to have your resume uh, sent to the selecting official. They'll determine who they want to interview, and, and they kind of go that route. So we do not usually do like a hiring event. We might have job fairs and things like that, but it would be unlikely that you would be interviewed uh, on site. Thank you. And I will have a couple more questions for you, um, a few that are still coming through in the chat, but um, someone asked a question uh, regarding citizenship. So I know you mentioned that you did have to be a United States citizen, um, but uh, Diana said that she does have a U.S. citizenship, but she wanted to get clarification on if she had to give up uh, her second citizenship that she has. She is per, uh, Peruvian. Yeah. yeah, I'm not aware that you would have to give that up. I think the main thing is you would just have to be a U.S. citizen. Um, I've not had that question come up. My recommendation would be to still apply. And at the time, if you were contacted for an interview, I think that would be a time to ask that to make sure that you're not going through a process and then find out that you wouldn't be eligible. That would be a question I would ask at that point. But I don't think so. And I don't know if, if Patrick or Angela knows more on that. They'd have to give that up. My understanding is you do not, you can be a dual citizen. You just have to be a citizen of the United States. 
Awesome. Thank you, Angela. And I just got another question in where uh, Melissa asked, how many years should your fez federal resume reflect? And I know you touched a little bit on that earlier, David, but uh, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit more about that. Sure. I would say you can go back um, as far as you have relevant experience would be what I would say. I know sometimes they'll say just the last couple of years and things like that. Um, anything you think would help you qualify for that position, so customer service experience, things like that, put them in there. The, the bulk of the rest of our questions, David, are pretty much specific to uh, specific industries. So individuals are asking if you have specific positions centered around uh, healthcare administration, uh, positions for individuals with MBAs. Uh, and then I also um, asked the question about the cybersecurity analyst. So those those are pretty much those specific industry specific questions that are left. And, and I will say this uh, with the, the master's degree, that is one of the things that can help you qualify at a higher uh, grade level, having proof of that. Awesome. I I think that's all the questions that I have so far. If anyone has questions, please feel free to ask. This is a great opportunity. You get to uh, hear it directly from those who uh, they're doing this work. So this is a great opportunity uh, to take advantage of. I think I just got a couple more questions when I said that. Um, there is a question. Um, is an associate's enough to apply to any basic position or entry level position at uh, Social Security Administration? I will, yep, I will answer that. That answer is um, yes, you can certainly apply. You could apply without any degree. Um, now, if you didn't have a degree, then of course you have to have a lot of relevant experience. If you have a, an associate's degree, then you're likely looking at that degree and experience as well. So that's kind of the difference on an associate and a bachelor's. A bachelor's, you're automatically qualified for entry-level positions. An associate, you're not automatically qualified. You're going to need to have some experience with that. David, I see uh, several questions about do you have to, uh, positions related to accounting or this or that, and we touched on that a little bit. Could you just repeat the the Direct Authority website again? People can take a look and see what's posted there. Yep. It, uh, so to find our positions um, that are posted in usajobs.gov, that's one where, place you can do it. Um, but then ssa.gov slash careers. That's going to tell you about our entry level positions that are part of the direct hiring authority, and there'll be some other information on uh, links on how to apply. Uh, it'll take you to Handshake, it takes you to Indeed, and things like that. Oh, thanks, Patrick. Put, yep, Patrick, Patrick put it in that. the uh, yeah. And and for for positions that aren't the entry level, for some folks that may have previous experience, might they be better off going to USA Jobs and looking looking through there? Um. I'm not sure I understand the question. What, what oh, I, I was wondering if the direct hiring authority uh, and the SSA gov slash careers was just for the entry level jobs. Yes. Okay, so for, for higher level jobs, for fee people with more experience, they should go to USA jobs. Exactly. And look yep. through that. Okay, yep. you, great. Now, there could still be information on that on our careers webpage. It can still mm -hmm. talk about those. But yeah, if we're going to post something, and, and I, I'll mention this, I mentioned that our claim specialist job can be posted at a grade nine, but a grade nine is not part of the direct hiring authority. Mm -hmm. That's only grade five and seven. So if we ever have a situation and another uh, authority we have that's uh, specific to students is what we call our pathways program. So that means you, if you have any degree in the last two years, you could apply under our pathways. Those would be what you would see sometimes in a grade nine posting. Um, but again, that is going to be just in usajobs.gov. Sending a resume in and having that be your application would not apply for a job higher than a grade, not get you in at a job higher than a grade seven. Perfect. Thank you. And a lot of the um, 
postings I see do have contact people on there, the recruiters that are organizing it. So you have a name, you have an email address, feel free to reach directly out to those folks too. Yep, um, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all who joined us today. Hope you got a lot of great information. Again, um, if we can help you, if you have some need or question, you just can't find the answer, get in touch with us at uh, Southern New Hampshire University Career Services at C-O-C-E career at snhu.edu. Um, David Marshall, Angela Hubbard, uh, Patrick Cook, thank you so much for being here with us and sharing all this great information. Uh, Tori Lynn, thank you for doing an amazing job with the questions in the chat. And uh, hopefully this has been helpful for all of you that have joined as participants and good luck to you on your searches. And uh, everybody, hope you have a good summer coming up. Thanks everybody. We'll, we'll call good it luck. a night. Good night everybody.